Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. Welcome to the second portion of the State and Future of Axonic talk that was presented at our conference in September in Amsterdam. A slight change of plan, this portion is going to focus on Axon Framework. And in the next portion that's going to uh, be presented to you in the next episode, we will focus on Axon Server and the newest product, which is Axon Synapse. I hope you enjoyed this portion of the talk and let's have a listen. So that brings us to the products. So what did we actually do in that product and what did actually change in that uh, besides those, uh, those few things that we got from, uh, from the community? And there's been some more learning in our, uh, in our environment as well. So historically, we started off with building Axon Framework just, well, actually as an experiment, just to play around with CQRS and event sourcing, but it led to uh, to, to simplify that, right? It, it turned into a framework that allowed people to use CQRS and ES, event sourcing. But then we noticed, okay, there's a couple of, uh, of challenges using CQRS and event sourcing at scale. So how can we improve the framework to, to help getting people ready to scale, right? And then helping people to actually scale. So that's when we started building a, uh, a dedicated event store, so just technology that is designed to store events and masses of them, right? And not have any performance uh, issues while doing so. And then uh, we notice, hey, there's, there's, there's commands and queries going, the, in the, uh, going around as well. So we need a way to, to, to route those messages better. So we started building a, a message routing system because we were not quite satisfied with the existing typically queue-based systems that were out there. And later on, we, we, we learned about those two separate products and how they were not quite easy to, to use, and we merged them together as Axon Server in 2019. But the whole history is about Axon Framework first, and then Axon Server coming out as you know, a way to solve specific problems that people running Axon Framework have. And there's a few things we've learned. And one of them, and the most important, I guess, is the benefits of location transparency. The fact that you have this messaging, what we call explicit messaging, these commands and events and queries, allows you to just build a big monolith and turn it into microservices whenever you need to. So we don't have to overcomplicate uh, over our architecture at day one, but we can do that any day we like. So whenever you feel like overcomplicating your architecture, you can do so tomorrow. That's fine. But more importantly, the benefits of location transparency, obviously this is something we knew, but we're starting to act on it more explicitly, are beyond the JVM. Who is not a Java developer here? <laughs> Who? <laughs> That's the guy that sat in the plane for 23 hours. <laughs> Just to show up here, to find out that everything is about a Java-based framework. Yeah. Anyway, you'll be fine. So one thing that we'll be, we'll be doing very soon, or as of the next release, actually, is you'll see that the roadmaps of Axon Framework and Axon Server will diverge somewhat. Right? They will still be connected. Obviously, we don't live in two separate worlds. Right? Those products live in the same world, but they will focus on different problems. where. Axon Framework is much more focused on developer problems and less about the, the messaging and the, you know, the operational uh, uh, things. Um, we have Axon Server to focus more on the messaging and the uh, event storage. So we'll change the release cadence of those two products as well as a result of that. But more details a bit later on. We, so well, since we had a designer uh, that, and he was done with the website, we thought, hey, let's, let's do our, our logos as well. So we have a couple of new logos for, uh, for the products. Uh, if you want to know all the, the, um, the reasoning behind the logos and what the symbols mean, uh, you can ask our designer and uh, you'll be, um, well, there's a, there's a long story behind it. But let's focus on framework for now. So let's, let's get some fun facts out. And um, the fun thing about Axon Framework is that it's open source, so you can ha find, you find all these tools that you know, gather interesting information about your, uh, about your Git history and 
and who's been doing what. So you can run those as well. You can find out, you can actually validate them. Maybe I completely miscounted some of those, uh, those facts. But the first commit was 4,663 days ago. That's 12 years and nine months. That was quite a long time ago for, I mean, for software, right? Fortunately, the framework now doesn't really look anything like, uh, like it was in, uh, in, in 2009. It currently has 228,522 lines of code. To be honest, I don't know what counts as a line of code, if an empty line is also counted documentation. Anyway, 128,000 of those are in production. And then I stumbled upon an interesting document, and do need to peek at the exact name. Carnegie Mellon University's Scilab of Sustainable Computing, uh, Sustainable Computing Consortium did research and they found that commercial software has 20 to 30 bugs for every thousand lines of code. So I took a napkin, and I'm not extremely good in math, but I can do some of it. So I figured then we should have around two and a half thousand to close to 4,000 bugs, right? I mean, it's, it's the truth, it's on the internet. GitHub told us that we've closed 949 of them. I didn't really check. They were all issues. I didn't check if we actually fixed them or whatsoever, but, you know, it's give and take. Right? It's a napkin calculation, right? So that means there is about 1,600 to close to 3,000 left. Did we say we need your help? Now, the good thing is this is about commercial software. Our software is not commercial, so those rules don't apply. We managed to get away with it. It's open source, so if you find a bug, you can fix it. Right? Or, well, we will. Well, the good news is we also increased the team. So the core team for a long time <coughs> was, um, well, <laughs> th there it is. Um, we've, we've managed to increase that team, so it's now five people of three are dedicated to Axon Framework, and two of them spend a significant amount of their time on it. But more importantly, the actual team, the real team, is you guys. There's more than 200 contributors that have contributed to Axon Framework in the history of the framework. And um, it's really sad for those 50, but over 150 of them still have the current code ownership, quote unquote. They are still blameable, according to Git, for certain lines of code in the head. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So let's play that git blame game. And, and I thought, okay, let's get some statistics, right? Who, who owns, quote unquote, who is blameable for any lines of, of code? And well, since Stephen has been working on most of this stuff, he is really on his way to own it. But he's not there yet. <laughs> so according to this count, there are still 74,000 lines of code on my name. So any of those 20 to 30 bugs per thousand lines of code are on me. And Stephen is really, really getting close. Uh, the new features barely made it. He did do a commit yesterday, and I'm pretty sure he did it on purpose just to get a few <laughs> extra lines. Of he just changed some stuff that I changed. Anyway, uh, so there's a little battle going on in the office right, about owning. Anyway, but that's not really important, right? It's just what happens at the office stays at the office. What we really care about is there's also a lot of owners that, well, own code, 150 of them. And I want, want to put three in the spotlight. And I, I did not check the attendee list or the registration list, but there's some, actually, one of those might be here. So if you're here, just make noise. So on the number three, Johannes. No? Too bad. Tim to bake. That's not too far away. That sounds pretty local. You here by any chance? No, too bad. Elin, Alexei, any? Ah, oh, too bad. Well, we could we could give it a shot. But even though they're not here, I think we can. Uh, they can hear us when we uh, we give them a little round of applause. <laughs> now, contributing to open source can be fun. What Elin did was not fun. He migrated all the unit tests from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Exactly. That's. Uh, I, I wonder if he's still okay. <laughs> anyway, our thoughts are with you, man. Come on, hang on. Anyway, so that's all community. But I am curious what Stephen has been up to to capture all of these lines of code from me, and maybe he can give a bit of shed a bit of light on on what happened. So, Stephen, please join me. Can you, can you all hear me? Is this working? Nice. So, yeah, well, I'll, I'll catch up to you, you know? I want to, I want to own this. I want to be the one to get the blame to fix all the things and then ask you to contribute and try fixing some of those bugs because that's, I don't know, I really enjoy that, that communication between you all. So, in the, well, we haven't done a conference last year, so they didn't have the chance to talk about 4.5. So let's do that right now as well. What we have been introducing in Axon Framework 4.5.0. So we got a list, of course. And the first of those is the bill of materials. So the thing that Milan already shared, it came from the community. There was a necessity to combine framework with all the extensions we have out there and to use working versions with one another. So this is where the bill of material comes in. And I highly recommend you start using that because it will just simplify your life out there. Secondly, we introduced a relatively small feature, but I think it's a very handy one, snapshot filters. So if you would be in the database space to store your snapshots, you could simply remove those, but you might not want to remove those. You want to keep those in there. But what happens if you have a new version of your snapshot, of the aggregate, for example? Then you have the old ones that you don't want to use. You want to have those new ones in place. This is where those snapshot filters come in, but you, in all honesty, don't really have to configure those. They will be set automatically for you. And if you use the revision annotation on your aggregate, for example, it will automatically filter out the other ones that don't comply with what you have in that annotation. Again, a simplification for all of you. So thirdly, a massive one which was a burden I was carrying for quite some time was the Kafka extension. We already had this in Axon 3, but it was really in a milestone state. We did move it towards Axon 4 once we released that, but it has been in a milestone state from Axon 4 to 4.5. I knew there were people using it in production, but we weren't overly, well, comfortable with it just yet. And that's one of the major things we did there as well. So I can comfortably say that you can start using that as well if you have Kafka in your sphere and you want to connect it to your Axon framework application. And lastly, this was the biggest introduction we did in 4.5, and that is called the pooled streaming event processor. I have a bit more on event processors to share about. So when you're thinking, thinking about the event consumption, event processing within the framework, event handling components are the things you would write. These are your classes containing the at event handler annotated methods in them. And these have the logic you need to do when it comes to handling events. In most cases, that is a projector, but it might be something entirely different. Hence why it's just an event handling component here. Underneath there, we have a thing we call the processing group. The processing group gives you a means to define other configuration needs when it comes to error handling or how you want to order your events if you're parallelizing streams. A processing group can be in charge of one, two, n number of event handling components, depending on the non-functional requirements you have. And then we have another layer. This is where we enter the sphere of this new feature. This is where the event processor comes in, which allows us to do the parallelization, which allows us to do the things like a replay, all the hefty benefits. And this is, well, the heavy bit about the pool streaming event processor, what I'm gonna talk about. So one of the things we did is we had a layer underneath. So we had two implementations already, a subscribing one, and a tracking event processor. And the tracking event processor really was doing a means of streaming the events to itself, to handle those, to give those to your event handling components. So let's first start off with what this tracking event processor does. It is the default streaming processor because it was the first one out there. But more importantly, it uses a thread factory internally with a configurable amount of threads. So you configure that, and when you start up your application, that's it. That's the fixed amount of threads you have. If you want to change that, you shut it down, you fix the number to whatever you need at that moment. Okay? Suits so the needs. What do these threads do? 
each of these threads will open a stream with your event store to get those events out of there. These threads will also, once they have a stream open, will process events per the segments you have. So the partitioning of your store, of your stream in those separate sequences. So each thread is owning a single of these segments and reading on its own accord based through one of those uh, streams it opens. Full streaming event processor does this a bit different. It has two thread pools, which you can configure in a more easier fashion. And you could share those if you want within that pool streaming event processor. But more importantly, actually, between every instance of pool streaming event processor, so that if you have an application which is very heavy on handling events, you could well, optimize by using a single executor for a certain set of those processors, optimizing a little bit over there. Internally, these thread pools well, have different purposes. The first one is there to open a single event stream. So it will always open a single event stream, and that is it. And it will use that event stream to read the events and to coordinate the activities towards those uh, workers it has underneath. The workers are in the second thread pool, and those workers reflect the different sequences you have, the different segments you've partitioned your stream in. So the second thread pool with our workers executing all that unclaimed work, and uh, well, this is where you handle the events. This gives us certain pros and cons, where the pros are that, well, we can easily share those thread pools, simplifying your life to some extent. Uh, we only have a single stream open. That's definitely going to save on I.O. I think that's a good one. We definitely seen some issues with just using the tracking event process. We have 10 or 20 of those. Could be problematic. Solved by the full streaming event processor. And more importantly, actually, there is no limitation on that one thread owning a single segment. This was the limitation of you being able to easily scale up or down, which is, well, gone in this case. The only con we have really is that the progress is limited to the fastest segment within that group, because the other ones, well, there's just a single stream. Enough about full streaming event process. Let's go to 4.6. Because, uh, well, in 4.6, we've done a ton of things. <laughs> Really done a ton of things, and uh, well, I'm definitely not going to talk about everything because that's just too much out there. Nice bit about the contributions. I'm just going to highlight a couple of these points out here as well. So, firstly, the Kotlin extension is no longer experimental; it's fully out there, so you can start using it. Secondly, <laughs> yes, Jan, I understand you're happy with that. <laughs> Milan already shared this as well. We have now introduced the means that you can use Jakarta as well in your namespace to simplify. Your, your life in your if you're in Java EE, or enable us to do CDI extension things like Milan was pointing out. We've got streaming queries, which you might already seen on the pages as well. We've got a multi-tenancy extension out there that you can simplify setting your application up for any number of tenants you have, integrated tracing, and well, spring native extension as well to speed up your, your startup of your application. But more importantly, really the heavyweight that made it took so long with all those things in it is the dead letter queue. So let me run you through the dead letter queue real quick. I see you really, really quick. So again, we're on the event handling processing, event process bit. The dead letter queue comes in when it's about processing groups. So it's the specificity of the processing group. Let's go through a regular process. We have an event processor, processor group, and our event handling component, updating events or updating the projections. Let's start handling events. So. Things are happy, events are flowing, we're updating our model, but all of a sudden, there's something wrong with the fifth event. Maybe the schema in there is not something you like, or your store is out of order, you can't really reach it anymore. What happens in a regular process is that an exception would be thrown, thrown to the processing group, and likely thrown to the event processor, meaning that you're stuck at this one event. You as a developer need to do something to fix this, and that's not, that's not really helpful, right? This is where our dead letter queue comes in. And the dead letter queue, if you set it up for your event processors, adjusts this processing group into a dead lettering processing group using a dead letter queue in the neck. Let's do the same exercise. We have our events, they're flowing through, everything is going nicely. We reach event five again, and there is something going wrong here. Instead of bubbling up the exception, the dead lettering processing group catches it, 
and stores this in the data queue for you to process it at a later stage. All fine. We thus proceed. We're no longer stuck. Go to the following event and we handle it. But there's something specific about this. So with what you can do with your processing groups is decide the ordering of your events when you're parallelizing it. That sequence of those events is very important. So if event D1 fails, we want event D2, which rightfully needs to come after that and expects the previous one to be handled. You don't want that to happen either. So you want that to be stored in the dead letter queue as well. So that's what it does. So it is essentially a dead letter queue of sequences in there. Okay. And if you want to trigger it, well, you can trigger it to handle it again. And you just tell the dead lettering queue to handle those events for you. So I already saw I should have been faster. So let me move on to the streaming queries. <laughs> With the streaming queries, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to steal all the thunder because I know my colleagues are going to talk about this as well. I'm just going to talk about the start point, which we are, and the end point. If you're dispatching a streaming query, you'd again use the query gateway. You see you get a publisher back for your reactive streaming uh, interface, and you can make that into a flux automatically. From the handling side, that means you could just return a flux, and that'll work. Very nice. We'll see in a bit how it's going to work. Thirdly, integrated tracing. You might be aware that we have another extension, the tracing extension, working based on the open tracing um, paradigm. That's, however, a bit they're, they're moving away from that. They don't want to use it anymore. And in favor, they're moved to open telemetry. So we've been thinking, will we just add an open telemetry extension? And we figured, no, it really belongs inside the framework. We want to be able to monitor more than just on the interceptors. We want to be able to monitor how, how long it takes to load my aggregate or how long it takes to create a snapshot or to load my saga. All those things are now in place with that integrated tracing, where you can do logging if you like, or based on open telemetry, requiring some setup, but giving you a nice trace throughout your system so that you can better uh, optimize it. This is my last one, the experimental Spring Native extension. Sounds dangerous, but Spring Native is still experimental itself as well, hence why we are too. Uh, allows you to combine Spring Native with Axon Framework so that you can use something like GraalVM to quickly start up your application. And what we're doing there internally really is registering all your message handling components. So your aggregates, your projectors, where you have your query handlers in there, because we're doing some reflective stuff. That's what the framework does. So we need to have those native hints in place so that it's going to work. So we do that for you. But secondly, we also do the things that we do reflective actions on, like our annotations, our serializable objects, and the things we do with our service loader. So I think I've already extended my time. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> but still, I still got more. <laughs> What's going to come in 4.7? Well, it might be interesting to talk about 4.7. Well, in all honesty, I think it's more interesting to talk about something else, about Axon 5. I truly think, or we truly think, that it is time to move over to a new major version of the framework. So I can gladly say that the planning phases have started already a bit before 4.6, actually. And we're now going to heavily invest in this. Um, and we're thinking about some topics that we're thinking about is moving towards JDK 17, because Axon 4 is still based on JDK 8. Another one is using reactive APIs throughout the entirety of Axon Framework, which I think is going to be a nice benefit for all of you. We want to change a bit about the configuration so that you're not necessarily tied to always using annotations, because that might enable us more nicer things with Quarkus and Micronaut, for example. And fourthly, serialization native messages. You can dive into this. I'm not going to, because there are still a ton of things. And this is not necessarily the important bit. The important bit is that I want your opinion. I want to hear what you need in Axon 5, what you think is beneficial. For that, we got in the foyer, we got a, a flip over. You can write things and definitely approach me or other teammates if you want to talk about what needs to change. So, extended my stay. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're used to time slots of 40 to 45 minutes. So this is a completely new experience for us uh, as well. So let's, let's see how far within today we can stay. Anyway. I'll, I'll keep it very brief. So last year or two years ago, we announced the availability of Axonic Cloud. 
which is basically the cloud offering of Axon Server. Um, so we, we had an option with shared clusters, and they were cost effective. You could launch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they were also on shared devices, so you really don't know how uh, how it's going to use uh, the, the CPU for anyone else, right? If you have noisy neighbors, then they might uh, impact your throughput. So what we've introduced is the possibility for private clusters. Uh, you can go to the console, and you can just click, hey, I want to have a cluster. Where do you want it? You can geographically, well, you can choose the geography where you would like to, to have it. Um, if there's any options there that you miss, uh, well, they, we can help set up custom clusters. We have a couple of customers that have very specific needs on data that had to be replicated to specific countries, and definitely not specific other countries. That's fine. We can, we can help you uh, design that. But more importantly, we've noticed that the applications run at the client side, or in their cloud, typically. Um, and we had the cluster running and the support teams and uh, the, uh, the, the monitoring done on our side. What we really want to be doing is move, oh, sorry, the, the, I'm trying to go too fast now. There, there's a bit of challenge there that there's legal and, and privacy uh, restrictions, uh, security restrictions that don't always allow you to have your data managed by us. I mean, you can trust us, but they don't for some reason. They're born to not trust people. So what we, what we want to do is move that cluster to your own cloud and then find a way to manage it for you. Right? And there's various ways, and it is done in certain, uh, uh, certain uh, enterprises. Uh, but we find out it's still tricky as those same two people that you saw on the earlier slide, they still have a big say in this. And this is where we really would like to have your feedback. Right? If, you want to, if you want us to manage it, what does that mean to you? I hope you enjoyed this portion of the talk about Axon Framework. Please join me next time as the server team talks about what they have been up to and what are their plans for the next releases. Allard will also talk about our newest product, Axon Synapse. I hope you have a great day and please join me next time. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.